Hello, welcome everyone to today's Creative Commons Open Culture Live webinar. It's entitled, Who's Open Knowledge? Decolonization, Indigenization and Restitution. Uh, my name is Brigitte Vizna and I'm a Creative Commons Director of Policy and Open Culture. And I'm really pleased to briefly introduce this webinar. Um, it'll be moderated by my colleague, Jocelyn Mariara, Open Culture Manager at Creative Commons. And here also from Creative Commons is uh, Connor Benedict, who's the Open Culture Coordinator. I also see a colleague, Jenner and Wessler, in the participants crowd. Thank you so much for joining everyone. Um, so together we work at Creative Commons to promote better sharing. So that means sharing that um, includes broad access and reuse that is done ethically, equitably, respectfully, responsibly taking into account not only the copyright status of a cultural heritage item, but also any other norms that might govern it as well um, in the context in which it forms part of any given uh, cultural heritage collection today. Uh, so this is the third Open Culture Live webinar. It's a series that we started last July, and the aim is really to address the key issues and questions that arise in the world of open culture. Uh, all the webinars are recorded and they're available from our Open Culture Resources page and directly on uh, CC's YouTube channel. And I'll share the link to that in a few moments. Today, we'll tackle a very big question. Who's open culture? And we'll look at it through the lens of decolonization, indigenization, and restitution. And part of the reason why we're asking this question is that as advocates of open culture, we believe that opening up their collections is what cultural heritage institutions are meant to do. Giving the public access uh, free of charge and without copyright restrictions to their, at least their public domain collections, is at the core of their mission. And yet, in some cases, many collections contain heritage that brings about specific and complex issues that go beyond the in-copyright versus public domain dichotomy. Uh, in 2020, we wrote on our uh, blog that, um, and I quote, open culture is, at the time we called open glam. Open glam is not only about sharing cultural heritage by respecting copyright law, but also how to do it more responsibly, collaboratively, and equitably. And this, to me is really crucial because it impacts on how we understand and how we value open culture in light of all the considerations, the norms, the rights and interests, the protocols, as well as any other forms of governance systems and structures that might and often do govern access and use of cultural heritage. So I'm really pleased that we'll get to hear from Jane Anderson, uh, Stephanie, Running Hog Johnson, uh, Camille Callison, and Erna Lillier. Thank you so much for being with us today to help us navigate this big and probably many other questions. So <laughs> over to you, Jocelyn, to introduce our panelists and start the conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bridget. Um, wonderful. So um, just a brief run of show for you all. What we'll do is I'm going to introduce each of the panelists one by one. They'll give a little introduction to their own work. And then we'll move on to a conversation. And then we'll be leaving about 15 minutes for audience questions. Um, we'll be dropping some information in the chat. Please feel free to use it. Um, please try to stay on mute so that we can be listening to the panelists. Um, I'll also pin them once um, we're all in conversation together so you can see them all at the same time. Um, and with that, um, I'd love to introduce first Jane Anderson. Um, Jane is the vice chair and founding member st and strategic advisor and co-founder of Local Context. Dr. Anderson is the associate professor of anthropology and museum studies and global fellow in the Engelberg Center for Innovation Law and Policy in the law school at New York University in Lena Pehoking. Jane has a PhD in law um, from the law school at the University of New South Wales in Australia. Their work is fo focused on philosophical and practical problems for intellectual property law and the protect protection of indigenous and traditional knowledge resources and cultural heritage in support of indigenous knowledge and data sovereignty. In 2023, Jane was awarded a 2.5 million grant from the Mellon Foundation in support of sustainability and future of local contexts. 
Local Contacts is a nonprofit organization founded in 2010 to support indigenous communities and manage their intellectual and cultural property. So with that, I'll pass it along to Jane to talk a little bit more about their work. Thanks, Jocelyn. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm here in Lenape Hoking, the lands of the Lenape nations. I want to pay my respects to the ancestors and particularly to kind of think through land acknowledgements as particular kinds of ways of reckoning with colonial pasts and understanding where we stand is also on Indigenous lands and these questions of property and intellectual property that we'll be talking about today have really, really long antecedents within larger frameworks of violence and dispossession of Indigenous peoples. So when we're talking about traditional knowledge and we're starting to think through some of these questions, it does still also come back to lands and territories and waters that are Indigenous. So um, my background is in intellectual property law, as Jocelyn uh, mentioned, and I guess I've been doing this work for 25 years. Um, I uh, many years ago started working in an Indigenous uh, archive in Australia, um, and that archive was um, well, it was important because it was an Indigenous archive, but it wasn't uh, it had only recently become Indigenous led and Indigenous run. It was actually created for um, anthropologists, historians, uh, missionaries, educators who had studied Indigenous people, uh, but did not, and so it was kind of like a repository, um, but the public of that archive was not Indigenous. It was not meant to serve Indigenous interests. It was meant to serve non-Indigenous researcher interests into the future. And as this archive had become an Indigenous archive, this big question of who is this material for? Uh, how do we get it back to the communities whose material this is, uh, became the kind of most important questions that that archive was trying to deal with. And it turned out because of the complications of copyright law and the kind of long colonial conditions of um, studying Indigenous people, that most of those uh, records within that institution were not owned by the Indigenous communities, but were owned by the researchers who had produced them, collected them, studied Indigenous people. Uh, and so that created this really big challenge for that institution in how do we create an ethical and also a legal framework to support the right of return, the return of these materials back to Indigenous communities. So, so I've been working on this kind of particular problem in terms of changing policy, changing deposit agreements, uh, working with Indigenous communities to create their own tribal law in relationship to intellectual property and data um, for a really long time. Uh, I founded um, Local Contexts uh, 14 years ago. And local context is a digital tagging system to kind of bring Indigenous interests back into um, museum, archive, library collections. So Indigenous names, but also Indigenous protocols and authority are properly represented within, uh, in, in, within institutional contexts, but also uh, how uh, Indigenous communities can assert control and governance over their collections and over data that is being produced now and will continue to be produced into the future. Um, and so it's kind of this really long temporal reach where we kind of talk about the history of making particular kinds of collections, as well as the rights and interests that remain with those collections, as well as what they look like into the future as Indigenous people uh, reclaim, hold, return, utilise, govern their own knowledge. And so, so this kind of question of Indigenous sovereignty is kind of central. Um, I guess local context was really responding to um, five key questions when it was, you know, kind of what it's trying to do. And the first is really that every Indigenous community has enormous collections of tangible, intangible cultural material, knowledge and data held in archives, museums and libraries around the world. Um, but significant information about these collections, including individual and community names, proper provenance, uh, is missing. Compounding that is that Indigenous communities are not large, uh, largely not the legal owners uh, because of the way in which copyright law has developed. And I think we'll talk a little bit about that, the relationship between copyright and colonialism. Uh, but this is not just a historical problem. There are more researchers working and collecting data and samples from Indigenous communities than ever before. And those kind of issues of ownership as well as kind of uh, ethical frameworks for research 
as well as significant mistakes that are in metadata continue into the digital lives of uh, these materials. So that tends to be what I work on uh, the most. I spend a lot of time working with tribal nations, developing agreements, uh, different kinds of rebalancing of relationships uh, and kind of changing different kinds of power relationships. Uh, it's you know one of the questions that I continue to grapple with um, in this context, and I get asked it a lot, is should there be a new law to protect Indigenous knowledges? Um, and I, my, my challenging question back to that is how can you re rehabilitate a body of law that was designed to dispossess Indigenous people in the first place? Um, and so kind of I'll leave that there for um, us to kind of continue to ponder, but it's great to be uh, in this uh, webinar with everybody. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that intro and leaving with us, us with that important question. Um, so next, I'll introduce Camille Callison. Um, Camille is a university librarian at the University of Fraser Valley. Camille is also a Taltan Nation member, is the university librarian at Fraser University, and a passionate cultural activist pursuing a PhD in anthropology at the University of Manitoba. She's committed to being a part of creating meaningful change related to equity, diversity, and inclusivity at the library, archival, and cultural memory professions. She is a founding chair and current co-lead of the National Indigenous Knowledge and Language Alliance, as well as the co-lead of Respectful the Respectful Terminology Platform Project. Um, professionally, professional contributions include IFLA and in, um, Indigenous Matters section, North American Regional Division, and a member of the IEE um, recommended practice for provenance of Indigenous peoples data. So with that, I'll pass it along to Camille. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, greetings, good people. I'm really honored to be here today and to be invited to speak to all of you. Um, I'm actually joining uh, you from um, Stolo Tamuk, which is um, the unceded traditional territory of the Stolo people, uh, known as the Upriver. Um, I'm Malcolm Allen, speaking people who have an intrinsic relationship to um, their land, and I continue to be grateful to be able to live and work in this territory as a guest and uh, do my best to uh, be able to respect them in the ways of their knowledge. So I do think that one of the um, things that we have to uh, work around with in traditional knowledge and uh, Indigenous knowledges, and I like to call it um, Indigenous knowledges rather than traditional knowledges, because traditional implies that it um, lies in the past and our knowledge is dynamic, it's changing, we're creating new knowledge on a regular basis, and we're also reclaiming uh, and reconstituting and rematriating our knowledges back to our land. And that's part of our uh, connection to our land and to our uh, culture, knowledge, and language. And of course, our water is kind of implied. We use land as kind of a universal thing as Indigenous peoples and as Teltan people. Uh, we say that we belong to our land. And so that's part of where we come from, no matter where we are in the world. Uh, we belong to uh, the land, and it's pictured here be behind me at a place known as Teltan. Uh, behind me also is Tiskia Chokima, so that would be Raven's uh, home. And I'm a very proud member of the Tiskia clan of the Teltan people, uh, which is the Crow clan. We have two clans, and we're matrilineal, so I think that's very important to note that we uh, recognize that. Due to colonization and many laws that are colonial, which Jane just talked about, um, but particularly in Canada, um, in the country we now know, know as Canada, is that um, it also um, included a prohibition to hold things like potlatch or sun dance and traditional ceremonies until 1951. Now, therefore, much of our knowledge is intangible and tangible. So material culture, um, traditional knowledges in the way of stories and other things were actually taken from our community and prohibited to uh, be able to be uh, told and shared, or um, we weren't allowed to um, enact our governance systems um, as we did previously, which also disrupted our communities. And I think some of that is a result of also colonization, but also um, uh, patrimony that was brought with it so that uh, 
there was inequality between um, uh, the genders. And um, I'm not sure if many of you are aware, but uh, Indigenous women had to take the, the Canadian government to the Hague to be able to reconstitute us to be able to have our status if we had married out of the community, whereas Indigenous men, uh, if they married out of the community, those women, even if they weren't Indigenous, uh, obtained um, what we call Indian status in Canada, which is the misnomer from uh, when a certain person got lost and called um, North American uh, Indigenous people Indians. And so part of that is that our knowledge is lie in, in many different repositories and cultural memory institutions. And they're not um, uh, gathered or preserved or even documented in the way that we would call um, this ourselves. And so part of the project that we're working on, and I'm working as a co-lead with Dr. Stacey Allison Kasson on the um, on the Respectful Terminology Platform Project, which really follows a cry from um, Dr. Jean Joseph, who was the title librarian for Dagomo Gizdewa and um, uh, the Wheatwatt Library, which is located at the University of British Columbia, uh, to let our people be known by our own names. So our knowledge has not been uh, organized or uh, even referred to in the way that we would call it ourselves. Very many colonial names that we are returning to as Indigenous peoples. And um, I think that that is really critical to know. And also, too, that we don't separate out our knowledge into library archives or museums, but it remains connected to our people. And so it is about reclaiming and reconstituting and rematriating that knowledge as, and other uh, tangible items uh, within that. And I believe that we have a responsibility to be able to work with Indigenous people by understanding their worldview, understanding the validity and uh, dynamic nature of our oral histories and uh, to work to um, to decolonize and re-empower Indigenous people. So involving them with their knowledge as to um, is critical in the collection, curation and preservation of Indigenous knowledges. So um, part of um, our work moving forward, I believe, is to educate um, um, others about this and to help them to be able to do that. And I think we do that by uh, the work that we're doing here today and the work that all of um, uh, the panelists and many of you um, joining us are also doing. And I'll leave the rest of that for um, for the questions that happen. But I do want to say madu in my language, which is thank you. And I raise my hands to you for uh, listening and for joining us today for this very important and critical discussion moving forward. Thank you so much. All right, with that, um, I'm excited to introduce our last panelist, um, Erna Lillier. Um, Erna is a curator of Indigenous knowledge and material culture at World Museum in the Netherlands, where she has a deep interest in ensuring that ethnographic and world cultures museums address their complicity and participation in difficult histories, such as colonialism, by being of service of those who continue to be most impacted by such legacies. Her particular passion is supporting the material culture based research of Indigenous artists, scholars and elders, not mutually exclusive roles. She has a background in the visual arts, museum studies and biological collections care and holds a doctorate from the University of Sydney and with that I'll pass it to Erna. Uh, thank you so much and I already feel uh... Uh, like I'm amongst really uh, impressive people on this panel. Um, so firstly, I'll start with an explanation of my role title, which I think uh, on reflection is a little bit misleading because I don't by any means uh, qualify as an expert in Indigenous knowledge, um, but I very much see my role as a facilitator of making the museum a better place for people to be able to access the Indigenous knowledge that is materialised in the collections. Um, that's part of a greater movement that has been happening in the Netherlands and in Europe uh, more generally, uh, which is to address the colonial past, but not, not only in terms of uh, breast beating, but in terms of what are the practicalities of moving forward. So we do have these collections and I'd say there's uh, 400,000 or more items in the collection. Um, it's a really big legacy. Uh, it's here now. We need to do something about that that makes it um, useful for people in the present day. 
and, and my interest is uh, useful for Indigenous people in particular. So I'll start actually with an example from today of the kind of work that we're starting to do and what I want to make normal for the institution, which is uh, making the collections available to diaspora who are in this country already. So in this case, um, my, my cousins in terms of uh, origin, so I'm from Papua New Guinea, but uh, there's a large West Papuan community here in the Netherlands for reasons of, of history um, and, and colonialism originally. Uh, so the collections are huge. They're really, really big for West Papuan material. They're the largest in the world. Uh, so it's super rich, but the only people who see it tend to be, well, the people who work in the museum, um, but also, uh, what would we say, researchers, researchers and experts of various kinds. Um, but more and more, there's uh, Indigenous experts, but not so much for Papua or the Papua community who's here in the Netherlands. And so what I wanted to do was formulate a different model for accessing the collections where it doesn't depend on you doing particular research. It's more about uh, making the cultural heritage collections of the people who are here available to them. And that's a very modest beginning, but actually that's where we need to start because people don't even have the knowledge that there are, uh, what is it, 40,000 or so items in the collections across the three museums. Um, so that's a, a modest beginning, but it's actually sort of the foundation that needs to happen so that the knowledge is out there about the collections. And what can't be accounted for um, in terms of even the, the digital uh, access to the collections that we have on the website is the personal experience of being in the presence of material culture collections. It's profound and it's profound every time and for each person in different ways, but uh, some people are in a state of um, shock. In fact, that's the thing that's most often said, a, a feeling of shock and then maybe uh, the power of the material itself. They're having a spiritual impact and experience of the, the spirit of things. Um, but also sadness because, well, why is it here? And, and why is it locked up in this depot? Because it's not even on display, it's in the depot. So I understand the, the impulse for openness being good in general, um, to bring it back to the, the more central um, discussion here. Um, but I think along the way, we'll probably find that there's also material where people are happy it's not online. So that's something I think that we'll all, well, all three of us will sort of be aware of as well. Um, I don't have a law background, so I'm actually approaching this meeting and, and I hope I can be of value in terms of uh, um, being a museum practice based person. So when we have this discussion, just to keep it rooted also in the practicalities, if we're talking about 400,000 items, um, how do you make it real? The strategy has to still work in practice. Um, yeah, so I might leave it there so that we can have more time for discussion. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I, I'm so sorry, I almost forgot one more panelist. Um, who um, is a really exciting addition because um, Dr. Stephanie Runninghoff Johnson, um, who is Oglala Lakota, is the founding executive director of Local Context. Stephanie's work examines the limitations and possibilities of decolonizing approaches in schools and communities and explores how changes in policy and practice that center indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing have a positive impact on indigenous communities and the institutions that serve them. In her role, Stephanie collaborates with and for indigenous communities close to home as well as across the globe. She brings her skills and knowledge of doing decolonizing and indigenizing work within institutions to local contexts and is leading the team toward a larger presence in addressing data sovereignty issues within indigenous, um, or excuse me, within institutions. Stephanie translates for institutions how and why protecting Indigenous data sovereignty is crucial and gives them a way to meet their obligations through local contexts, TK and BC labels and notices. So that I'll pass it to Stephanie. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the, the intro. Um, so uh, I'm Stephanie. Um, as an Oglala Lakota woman, I come to you today as a guest on the lands of the Palouse Band of the Nimi Pu people. Um, and as, as many of you have already said, that's a really important distinction. I am a guest on these lands, um, even as I am also an Indigenous woman. And so um, my background is really um, uh, focused on Indigenous data sovereignty, and I've come at this really through an educational sense in so many ways up to this point. Um, I am uh, now, very excitingly, the Executive Director for Local Context. I've been with Local Context for about a month at this point, um, and um, it, I, like I said, I'm very excited to be here and do this work. Um, coming coming to this, you know, um, as, as somebody who's done a lot of work with Indigenous communities over the last couple decades, um, oh, it's weird to say that. Um, so uh, yeah, I've been working with Indigenous communities um, and Indigenous sovereignty in general has been a big topic around the work that I've done. Data sovereignty has become more and more obviously important over the, the last couple of decades. Um, and so I do a lot of work with, with nations who, um, want to and do educate their their tribal members, their children, and thinking about um, as an educator, how do we, and I think this part is really particularly um, important to our conversation today, but how do we in, educate our children um, the way that we want to do that? How do we take on that sovereign role um, or um, enforce the sovereign role that we already have um, when we think about the information that we want to put out there, um, the information that we put into schools, right? So um, if we're talking about a tribally controlled school with tribal students run by tribal entities, the information that we can teach in those schools perhaps is different or um, is is richer, is deeper, is more culturally relevant than if we're thinking about, are we talking about a public school system? And so um, what I like to think about is, is who gets to decide that? Who decides that? It's a really, really important question. Um, and I will always argue that our indigenous communities get to decide what knowledge is shared. Um, and and as, as people have already been talking about here, that ability, that ability, that that right, not ability, the right for that has been in many times taken away from our indigenous communities. When we think about cultural collections and museums and libraries, right? Um, our indigenous folks didn't say, oh, here, you should put this in your museum. Um, it, it was simply taken. And so one of the things I'd really like to point out as we begin this conversation is that this is actually a settler colonial problem, um, not just a colonial problem. This is a settler colonial problem. And, and the reason that I really want to put that forward and make that distinction is that settler colonialism is an ongoing process. It is not something that happened in the past and that we're beyond. We are still experiencing that um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's important to, to consider that when we think about what do we do with these these collections and these items and the especially as we think about digital digitization and the digital um, materials that are out there how do we give our indigenous communities back that um, the 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 way that we we put it out there how do we give that back to them how do we think about um, making sure that those communities have say over the information that's that's out there. Um, and that's part of why I'm here at Local Context is because we have a way to try to do some of that work, may not be all of that work, but it's a really good step in the right direction toward making sure that our Indigenous communities have a say over all of their their um, cultural heritage, their their information that, that gets out into the world. So I will I will stop there because I am really excited about this conversation. So thank you. Thank you for letting me be here. We'll be there. Wonderful. Thank you so much to all of you for joining. And um, I'm so excited to start this conversation. And I'd really like to kind of use that as a jumping off point. Um, and this is something that um, I think everyone was really interested in talking about um, that colonialism isn't something that is just in the past. And so um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on in what ways does settler colonialism impact today's management of indigenous knowledge? And bear with me while I pin all of the panelists so you can see each of them. I'm happy to start with that question. Um, for those who know me, I, I'm very opinionated about this. Um, so colonialism um, conditions the creation of the collections 
in a very specific pointed way and so when we're kind of talking a little bit about you know we need to be cognizant of say copyright law and making collections available that are in the public domain we kind of miss one of these primary questions is how do these collections come to be made in the first place for who were they made and i think erna you spoke to that really clearly in relationship to the papua collections that are in your institution um but so it's not just how the collections are made it's then how the collections are classified what information is important the different categories that are applied the different ways in which particular kinds of collections are grouped together so there's all these different kinds of um frameworks of colonial logic that go into how those collections are understood made available um rendered visible within institutional frameworks so it's and but it it really begins with these settler colonial relationships that meant that indigenous culture could be collected in the first place or, or and who was doing that work and why they were doing that work and i think camille also spoke to that in relationship to at the same time as the 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 government is banning potlatch ceremonies particular kinds of people are going out and collecting regalia and different kinds of important important material whilst at the same time the government is banning the actual practice of potlatch and that is an, another there are many many examples of very similar kinds of intention that sat behind the treatment of indigenous people um that the collections are just one manifestation of the larger project of settler colonial control over indigenous bodies indigenous culture indigenous knowledge and indigenous lands so i'll just i'll finish there and let others speak in um could i jump in oh sorry camille were you going to yeah i was going yeah, to you go, ahead. go ahead please and so I just want, kind of wanted to follow up on some of that because I think that's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of difference between if we have the um, uh, indigenous knowledge, whether it's uh, material culture or tangible or intangible knowledge as connected to our community or held in outside institutions or repositories. So part of that is that it's not organized in a way that we would recognize it. It's not named in a way that we would recognize it. It's also um, doesn't have the protocols attached to it. So uh, when we're looking at knowledge, there's there's men's knowledge and there's women's knowledge. And um, there's there's things that we um, as uh, at me as a Teltan woman have access to and also as part of my clan, which is why it's very important for me to say that I'm part of the Teskia clan. So I wouldn't be able to tell a wolf story or a Chiona story uh, in our language, but also to many communities. And when I was um, at the University of Manitoba and in uh, Anishinaabe and uh, Aniwa um, area, and also the Dakota Sioux, there was uh, stories that could only be told in the winter when the snow's on the ground. Uh, so this is actually even impacted by climate change. And then there's things that are not available for other people to be able to be seen. And even the word potlatch is a quakwakwala term, which is from the central coast. We use a feast system up north, which is similar, but there's many different types of feasts. And that's one type of feast. And so I think that there's a lot of things that are not actually being um, uh, recognized when we're collecting, displaying, and describing um, Indigenous uh, knowledges in all forms. And I think that that's where things like local context comes in, but also too, it's really about creating a relationship with the community where that knowledge is from, or the nation where that's from, or the clan where that's from. Um, and I think that that's really critical. And geographically uh, connecting that knowledge or uh, that material back to that community. And I, I can honestly say that when you go, when that, um, when that item, um, we've seen examples of repatriation or rematriation of things like totem poles. It's amazing because that uh, becomes alive and we believe that those are living. And so that knowledge that comes from that is really critical 
also too, when we're talking about stories, there's stories that mean something to you when you're a child with child knowledge. There's something that means something different when you're a teenager and in school or when you become a mother or father as you get older. And that knowledge changes and stories have that dynamic way of being able to teach you as you move through your life. When it's held in a colonial institution, it's categorized in a certain way, accessible in a certain way, and it's not actually appropriate. And once that knowledge becomes open, it's very hard to um, pull it down or use a takedown policy because it's out there. And we all know about being able to search back in the web. So it's really critical that we work with the communities that this came from, create relationships that are respectful and reciprocal and to be reverent of other knowledges. And I think that that's really critical to be able to uh, provide that imprint of reverence for future generations. That's, I believe, what our, our duty is to give that moving forward. And I'll just turn it over to, I'm sorry that I jumped in there on someone else. Um, no, thank you. And I think uh, that, that um, your observations also fit with Australia and every other place that's a settler society um, as well, where the significant, the importance of recognizing particular knowledge is for particular people, that there's all kinds of um, protocols as well. And so uh, the point I was going to make earlier is perhaps a little, um, a little trivial, but it's, it's not only settler societies, it's also, uh, in the mother countries of the <laughs> colonists. So uh, the sim similar observations hold true, but it's also a little bit different. There's additional things I'd say, which are not to do with suppressing people here, but how people have been taught, how like the Dutch were taught how to manage actually their colonies. So Tropa Museum, that's the, the specific history of that place. It was a place where colonial officers would go to learn about the possessions. So, so that means what kind of resources can you get there in terms of uh, raw materials, types of um, uh, plantations that are suitable in these places, what grows well, what are the high value crops, uh, how, how to manage labor, how to pay labor, all of those kinds of things. So actually it's a teaching place for how to be a good colonist. That's one thing. Um, the other thing, if I look at Leiden, the history is much more to do with the creation of the discipline of anthropology. So the creation of disciplines, it's not even at the stage of uh, colonies and what you're doing to subjugate people in place. It's how do you categorize people uh, and that being built into a discipline. And this is the place where you do that. Actually, it's it's one branch of how you create a discipline that others people. Um, and uh, World Museum has really significant, so in Rotterdam, has really significant missionary collections. Missionaries are really foundational for the colonial project. I mean, they're the shock troops, basically. They come in first and, and make the connections so that, you know, the, the colonists proper can come in and, uh, you know, plant their seeds. It's not, um, it, it's very intrinsic to it. And those collections are the oldest, they're the most precious in some measures of value, uh, but also for the people, like Indigenous people looking back, they'll also uh, be significant because they're the furthest away in time, the most lost, the most distant. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to add that dimension to even in the non-settler places, there's um, aspects of uh, subjugation, separation, <laughs> othering that, that are happening in a slightly different way. I, I'd like to add something that perhaps is simple, but is really important, is that when we, when we talk about settler colonialism, what one of the tenets of settler colonialism is that the settlers come and they stay rather than just extracting. They do extract 100%, but they also stay. And one of the things about staying is that they they steal the land. The land is the kind of the thing that they want. But along with that, when we talk about indigenous people, because indigenous people are inherently tied to their land and to their place, what that means is that the settlers are also stealing indigenousness, indigenous knowledge. Um, and so, I think the point that I want to make is that when settlers came, they stole our land, 
and they stole our knowledges and they stole our artifacts and they stole our, stole our cultural um, heritage items. And that is still continuing till today, till right now. Right, settler colonialism, like I said earlier, isn't past. It's currently happening right now. And so that process is an ongoing process. And so when we think about the, our institutions, they are still settler colonial institutions and they're still um, involved in that extractive process. And so I think we, as we think about this question, we really have to keep that as kind of the basis for what we're thinking about and what we're talking about is that settler colonialism is ongoing. It's not something that's in the past um, and that extraction is still occurring today. So, so part of it is how do we, how do we deal with that? How do we mitigate that? How do we, um, I mean, I would love if we could just, you know, change that. Um, but our institutions are big and broad, and that's a really hard question. So, um, I, I just think we need to keep that in mind as we as we think about that question. I just wondered if I can add to that, that I agree with Stephanie 100% that it's still ongoing. We have over 5,000 uh, murdered and missing Indigenous women, girls, and uh, two-spirited um, uh, individuals in Canada alone. Uh, they stole our children for residential school or in the, in the United States boarding school. The last residential school closed in 1996 in Canada. It's not something that's in the distant past. And I think that that's really important to note because this is still ongoing. And a lot of that is about uh, man camps with resource extraction that's happening with Indigenous women and uh, girls and two-spirited um, uh, men. And I think this is really fundamental that this is still ongoing in many places across the um, uh, globe and that we have to recognize that this is something that is not in the distant is not in the distant past it's still happening today so i think that hopefully that helps to contextualize that we're not talking about something that happened long a long time ago we're talking about something that is currently still happening today thank you um so one of the key aspects um that you each were talking about was the way that language and categorization plays a part in this colonialist project um, could you speak more about the process of reclaiming that language, for example, through projects like the Respectful Terminology Platform Project and others that I know many of you work on? Well, I, 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 if I, if you want me to speak about the Respectful Terminology Project, it's really important. The platform project is really important to be able to uh, work with um, and it follows um, on the shoulders of many giants that have done this work before us for well, 50 years ago. The, the Brian Deere classification system was developed by a Kwagi librarian in 19, um, I believe it's 73, but it's very early in the morning on the West Coast, so I might not have my the date, right? Uh, but And it follows those decades of labor by Indigenous people that's been done either voluntarily or from the side of their desk or um, uh, in addition to other uh, uh, work and family and community commitments. It's really about trying to create more respectful terminology to um, and accurate representations of Indigenous peoples, names, places, and cultural identifiers. Um, and that's really about creating an imprint of respect and an imprint of reverence for future generations. So when our community members open up something and others um, um, who are not from our community open up something and they see an Indigenous woman referred to as a squaw, which, by the way, is a very respectful term of a woman coming, a girl coming of age that has been taken and used as a derogatory and slur term against Indigenous women. Um, and it it is uh, used to describe Indigenous women. What do they start to think about those women? They start to think in that derogatory fashion. So how do we change that? And those things are embedded as part of colonialism, as part of organizing information, access points. We see it even if you want to Google that term, uh, you'll see many things come up underneath it. And it's really about not saying that we're going to modify um, existing terminology, but that we're going to create terminology in relationship with community using what we call the four R's in Canada of uh, relationship and uh, reciprocity. Uh, respect and uh, relevance and working with communities in a good way uh, moving forward. So it's about creating um, uh, that kind of um, ways of knowing and honoring that as related to our culture and heritage, language and knowledge. So uh, it is really um, 
and ambitious and uh, um, uh, work that we're moving forward with, but I believe that it has the ability to be able to change the way that we think. And it's really in keeping with um, uh, what we call the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And we were just talking about how many different ways of saying UNDRIP or UDRIP that there is, but it really is about Article 31 of um, that declaration where Indigenous peoples have the right to be able to maintain and pass on our Indigenous knowledge in the way that we look at it. Um, ourselves. And so it is about data sovereignty, uh, knowledge sovereignty, and us being able to control our own um, knowledge. So we need to work in community in relationship with communities uh, so that people are able to uh, pass forward that knowledge uh, using cultural concepts of uh, protocols or so copyright, if you're talking about cultural concepts of copyright, but doing it in the appropriate cultural manner so that it's taught in that way and it's passed on in that way to future generations so hopefully that helps to explain that project and I feel like I'm very much missing my co-lead um, uh, Dr. Stacey Ellison uh, is in right now but uh, but I, I want to make sure that I acknowledge that she is an equal partner in this work moving forward. And please anyone else feel free to jump in on this too I would love to hear your thoughts on um on language and categorization and, and sort of the reclaiming of that. Stephanie, do you want to go and then I'll add? Sure, I'll, I'll be fairly quick. Um, so um, language is incredibly important in a lot of ways. Um, and one of the things that I think about, um, the way that we speak is the way that we think, right? And so the way that we interact with the world is really, really tied to language. And so, um, when we lose or are, have our languages taken away from us, it really reframes the way we can think about the world. Um, and, and so having indigenous languages present and being vital and being, you know, um, it's really, really important for our indigenous cultures and indigenous peoples to have our languages and be able to use them and speak them and think them, not just speak them. Um, and so, just just from my background, there's a lot of um, Indigenous communities who are trying to educate their young people in ways that include their own languages. And so um, I think that we actually have a really um, beautiful opportunity when it comes to digitizing some of these and, and, and collecting this information for our Indigenous communities to use, right? Like, can we take the technology? Can we take this as indigenous communities and indigenous people and use it for our own purposes and so um just as a as a um coming from an educational perspective there's lots of of, of nations doing this work in their schools and in their homes and in their communities using using all the um the resources that we have right we're we're inventive and resourceful people and we can take that and use that um in in good ways right so uh, that's a hopeful, hopeful note, and then I'll I'll pass it on to Jean. That was that was what I was thinking about. Um, so I'm going to kind of circle back to what you were talking about, Stephanie. But I just wanted to speak to, and I just want to say how much I appreciated um, these differentiations between colonial institutions like Erna works in within um, within the kind of Dutch context and the kind of settler colonial context that we might um, be dealing with within kind of a, an Australian or a uh, Turtle Island context as well. And the different kinds of um, uh, perpetual projects that are um, embedded within those kind of settler colonial contexts. But I think one thing that is really similar, so there's these important differences, but what is also, what is really similar is some of these classificatory logics some of the categorizations that happen across all these institutions that in many ways work to reduce the complexity of Indigenous culture, Indigenous relationships, Indigenous knowledge. Um, and that goes from communities' names or not even including communities' names to the different kinds of ways particular kinds of objects become classified together. And who's doing that work? So for me, it kind of points to uh, that classification itself is not a neutral activity. Uh, it is an activity that embeds particular cultural logics uh, and then normalizes them. 
so that it becomes harder to see the work that those particular cultural logics are doing within the very classification and categorization of indigenous culture itself. And this is whether you're in a museum in uh, Holland or a museum in Australia or in uh, what's currently known as the United States. So being attentive to those kinds of forms of the way in which language becomes deployed and kind of what information is important uh, and how it creates these huge difficulties for Indigenous communities to reclaim, but not only reclaim, to find their collections. And so, you know, we, we know and, uh, you know, work for so many different communities who are looking for their collections because institutions, they have a responsibility to disclose what Indigenous collections they have so that Indigenous communities can actually engage with them and make decisions and governance around those collections. Um, so that's kind of just like one one side piece that if you don't know where your collections are and they're all around the world, they're not, you're not just dealing with one institution, you're dealing with 200 institutions, the amount of labor that that takes, and it's often invisible labor, is really enormous. The, bur the burden is constantly put back onto indigenous peoples to find the collections that were taken from their lands and waters. But the classificatory logics also create very difficult burdens in relationship to doing that work. I would say the other kind of really important uh, kind of work that sits around, say, for example, language revitalization and the work that Indigenous communities are doing is, is, is partly being reconnected into um, uh, documentation of Indigenous languages. And this is really where some of these kind of really uh, copyright issues turn up uh, in relationship to who owns those language materials and what happens when Indigenous communities are regaining access to those language materials that might have been documented uh, by a linguist or by an anthropology by anthropologist. But the community doesn't control or own their language materials that's held by the third party who made them or who wrote them down, particularly this is where some of the the very clear intentions within copyright law itself when you've got it, when you're dealing with oral cultures who didn't necessarily write their languages down, interact with another cultural group that does write language down, and then that you become the rights holder over those language materials. So then Indigenous communities are in this position of having to renegotiate or trying to wrestle control of their own language back. And this isn't just a, a small, small part of the problem. It's a major part of the problem. And I, if for people who have seen what's been happening in the United States in relationship to ownership of dictionaries, the way in which different kinds of control of word lists uh, and the different kinds of companies that sell dictionaries back to communities, you kind of got to really, you see the extent of the problem that we're actually dealing with. And then also the role of copyright in perpetuating that particular problem as well. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I kind of want to get into a little bit, um, you know, open, open culture. We're here to talk about open culture and the intersections between Indigenous knowledge and open sharing. Um, and really this question, keeping Bridget's intro in mind, is open always good? Um, and, you know, we're really excited to hear these answers, which I think I can predict. <laughs> I think I can talk a little bit about open. Um, I'm very much a fan of open access, so I don't want people to um, misunderstand that. And, I, and I'm always very passionate about that and also open education resources uh, uh, providing um, uh, students in educational institutions with, um, uh, with resources to be able to be successful in their studies. So I want to preface it with that because I think that that's really critically important to be able to actually provide equity um, within diverse populations. So when students don't have the money for resources, they're not as successful as others. And I think that that's very critical. So I want to say that, but I also would say uh, with that and uh, actually um, 
um, you know, with that check about Indigenous knowledges. If you are going to share Indigenous knowledge um, in an open context, it has to be in full agreement with the um, community that it came from, with that descendant community. So there's protocols with sharing, and I think I've talked about that, whether it's seasonal, situational, um, age-related, gender, um, it depends on uh, where, whether or not you are privileged enough to be able to have that information, whether it's your knowledge or your, or your sorry, your family that you're from, your clan. Um, all of these kind of th protocols need to be observed in relationship with the community. So if you haven't actually um, gone to the community and talked to the community about that, that's um, uh, really the first step in any relationship and if you're not talking with somebody how can you say you're in relationship with them so then you're still holding um knowledges tangible and intangible that have been taken often forcibly from communities um or without their consent or even often without their knowledge um so working with that is really critical and i believe that we have that responsibility in cultural memory institutions to work with communities on that I will say that when we, um, some of the oldest um, uh, surviving uh, recordings of the Teltan knowledge are located in uh, museums and in, in, in archives. And we are so, it's like reading a relative that you haven't seen for years and years and years that you thought was gone, that was lost, and they come back home. So it's a joyous celebration when we're able to do that. And I believe that that's Part of our responsibility in this profession to be able to um, uh, to be able to facilitate that uh, return, whether it's digitally or actually physically, back to the community, so that that um, knowledge can be used, especially in the course of languages where languages were often forbidden to be spoken, and deeper layers of our knowledge can only be accessed and understood within the languages. So if we're actually want to be able to uh, pass that forward, those deeper layers of that knowledge are embedded within our languages and those languages. So when I say a certain word that might be, I might be able to explain it to you in baby language, but there's a deeper layer of that, that people who are well-versed and say PhDs, like our elders who are our PhDs in our knowledge, will be able to tell you where that word came from, where its origin is, what it means. They also create new knowledges. So those are really important. At, at one point, we had less than 20 fluent speakers out of 5,000 Teltan. Now that's horrific, but that's the result of colonization. That's the result of, uh, of residential school and also too of resource acti extraction activities in our communities and not being able to access education and jobs within their own community, which is actually about 28 hours drive north our main community of what's known as Telegraph Creek, uh, British Columbia. So I think that all of these are really complex and intricate questions that you're answering. And it has to be um, accessed with a lens of how do we do this in a good way? How do we move forward in a good way? And how do we, as um, professionals in this um, in this important field, it's very important the work that we do, or else we wouldn't be doing this work. And I think that all of us are passionate about it. We all want to do it in a good way. But how do we create those relationships? And it's not an easy task. It's not something that's a one and done, and it's not something that's instant gratification. It's years of work with community to be able to understand it. I couldn't go into Anishinaabe or Haudenosaunee community and be able to know how to do that as a Teltan woman. I don't have that background. I rely on the elders who are our PhDs and I believe that they need to be adequately compensated for their work, much like other people are being paid a wage. So they're doing it on community timelines and within their seasons, within their protocols is really critically important. It might, you need patience and you need understanding and also to, to be able to just be respectful in the way that you do that. And I think that's critical in um, moving to open um, access of knowledge. I'm happy to add on onto this um, in the sense that and I think this is this is part of the part of the tension that sits here. This is not fast work. 
this is kind of slowing down the archive or slowing down um, in a different kind of way in order to create relationships and uh, create meaningful and respectful relationships, which often flies in the face of digitization, where we're trying to digitize and get it out there as fast as possible. And at the same time, we're kind of saying, hey, but you actually need to have these relationships and the relationships take time. And, you know, this is a durational project of um, reparative care that needs to happen around these collections. And um, and I think that that, you know, so many folks who are in institutions um, are like, ah, this is going to take, this is too much. This is going to take too long. We don't have time. And it's like, it's, these collections have been hundreds and hundreds of years in the making. And they're going to take hundreds of years in order to kind of deal with those histories and do the proper work of building the relationships of care that need to be in place. This is not a fast project. Well, it's that kind of deliberate care and responsibility and building the relationships that's going to bring forth a different kind or a more nuanced understanding of who decides what is open and when and under what conditions. And so kind of opening up that kind of space for that kind of conversation is one that um, I, I feel is, is quite daunting for the amount of collections there are. And so I was going to ask Erna, who um, you kind of working in the, in these areas, this, this kind of practice based question of like, how do you build these relationships and how do you build these relationships across different kinds of countries and different communities that may not have ever come to Holland or might not have ever come to those institutions? Just wondered if you could share some of the of your experiences in relationship to that kind of practice based dimension of this work. Um. So I, I feel um, a deep appreciation for the idea that language limits or the language we use is uh, limiting who can access the collections. Um, specifically with this museum, uh, it's in Dutch. <laughs> it's in Dutch and it's also in, uh, it uses categorizations that are useful if you work in a museum, but it's not necessarily um, very, intuitive for anyone. I mean, let alone Indigenous people from specific places, it's not intuitive for any human, really. Um, so, so that's the, the first thing. But um, I would say that the way it has been done in the past, and it's uh, more or less continuing, I guess, is it's ad hoc in terms of finding and learning about those uh, specific cultural terms and the correct terms for specific places um, because of course there's great diversity in any one place. Uh, New Guinea is a prime example, so I keep going back there. It's an area of interest for me and connection. Um, so uh, to, to use one name, uh, maybe as incorrect as the English name actually. Um, so are, are you actually perpetrating a further harm by mislabeling a second time. And so even with the single expert, Indigenous expert coming in, doing their own research, and then they have an interest actually in improving the database, which again, another construct, um, that is one way that it has been done in the past. But I think this is something that, that we want to do more forthrightly. So actually just engaging people for a specific role, can you go through this collection, identify a name for us and then make that a uh, specific person by people by specific people. Uh, but it will be ad hoc and it'll be um, a rolling project rather than anything I could say is going to happen in a kind of uh, en masse way. Um, though it's, maybe it's worth mentioning here, there's uh, digital museum projects in various places. Um, where people are doing the, you know, the seeking out of their collections around the world and then putting them together in a central place. And they're doing it from a perspective. I'm thinking about uh, uh, in Zambia, Samba Yonga has done the history, uh, Museum for Women's History. And I know that she's always seeking digitally and also 
uh, you know, through her attendance at, attendance at conferences, for example, um, to make connections with people who are in institutions across the world so that she can put them in one place. And so um, there's activities like that where it's not depending on the museum getting its its stuff together. It's, <laughs> it's um, actually people doing it themselves, but they're doing it in country. Stephanie, anything you want to add on? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, the the idea of everything being open is a very Western, very settler colonial notion. Um, and so I, I, I think my answer to the actual question is no, not everything should just be open. Um, but it's much more complicated than simply that answer, right? As as we as we've already heard, everybody, I, I really appreciate the comments others have made so far. Um, and as somebody who identifies as a researcher and as a scientist in many ways, I do think that lots of information should be open and should be um, available. Um, and as an indigenous person, we have to really trouble the constructs around it should just all be open. Um, and and because because we have to be in relationship with with that information and with those knowledges. And many times when we're talking about in, in being an indigenous, um, doing things in an indigenous way, you have to do it in relationship. And so um, as, as has already been pointed out, that relationship piece is really, really key. And so I think it's a really complicated question because in many ways, yeah, we should have information open and available and out there for everybody. And when we are talking about indigenous knowledges, you have to be in relationship with, with those people or you can fully understand them. So I, this is a really hard question for me, quite honestly. It's, a, it's, it's really complicated. And, um, and, and so I love that we're having this conversation, right? Like these conversations need to happen in order to kind of pick through some of that. Um, and it does take time. So um, my answer is no, but, or no, and, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, one more question for me, and then um, I'll be opening it up for audience questions. So feel free to start typing those into the chat and we can um, start sifting through them while we answer this one last question, which is, um, how does rematriation of physical objects impact digital collections and online sharing? And how should it impact digital collections? Uh, I'm happy to start with that one. Uh, so I think one of the challenges, I'm going to kind of go back just a moment and then maybe get to the answer of that question. Um, one thing that a lot of uh, communities that I work for speak about is not knowing where their collections are to start with. So one one strategy is to get digital copies of collections or digital versions of collections so that they can see the kind of corpus of the collections that are out there and then make very deliberate decisions about what needs to come home and um and so then kind of working working within the benefits that the digital offers in order to kind of think through the enormity that has been taken from the community and then be able to prioritize what urgently needs to come home. Um, and I think that there are, um, so then kind of your question is a little bit the other way around, like what happens when the, the materiality and the, um, the relations and the ancestors come home, how should that affect the kind of digital record in a different kind of way? And I think it is about, um, you know, making sure that indigenous voice, indigenous perspectives, recognizing the, the inherent sovereignty that indigenous communities have over those collections is also embedded in the record um, and kind of updated. I've seen a couple of instances and have worked on instances where adding that kind of critical information from the community 
and as a record gets updated tends to kind of make the institution look like that information was always in the institution when actually there was not that information in the institution and the consequences for cultural memory in not having that information in the record uh, which had significant consequences for how Indigenous people are constructed, not seen, uh, made invisible, so many different kinds of consequences of having mistakes in the record. So I think it's about um, listening and taking care when certain kinds of material are, you know, are re rematriated about how the community wants that to be referenced in the digital record. I'm going to leave, leave it for others to kind of speak into Camille. Thank you, Jane. I I, I totally um, wholeheartedly agree with that. I would like to uh, talk a little bit. I mean, putting on my archivist hat, I mean, I think that um, obviously the priority for preservation and digitization is going to be those items at risk. And so to, to my way of thinking, if you need to digitize, digitize, and then don't uh, provide access to that until you've worked with the community. Um, there's a couple of good examples that I think are really important, and I'm going to put them in the chat in a minute, that are uh, the Indigenization Project at UBC and Sustainable Heritage um, uh, networks that I'll, I'll put in those chats, but I think that one of the things is that um, it's really important when Indigenous people share knowledge with you for your collections that you actually cite them. That's really about citation justice. So when we share knowledge, what we're doing today, um, it's not about people just taking that knowledge and using it for their own purposes and writing it down, which is what anthropologists did. And and knowing that I come from that background, I'm going to um, be able to actually make those statements. Uh, but it's they don't own the knowledge. And that was what happens under copyright. So we know that there's these issues. But it's still currently going on. People hear things from Indigenous people in conversation or in lectures. And then they're actually writing it down and citing it and getting that ac academic recognition. But also, too, when Indigenous people go and look at that, they're like, how do you even know that? And so it's not valid for us when we go. So it affects the validity of that. So when I share something, I will say often, well, I learned that from auntie, so-and-so. And even if I didn't do that, even as a young person, uh, my auntie or, or my adopted grandma would say, who did you learn that from? Because they want to know who I learned that from, whether it's valid knowledge or not. And they might say, oh yeah, that person knew that because that family trapped in that area or hunted in that area it's then valid. And so it is about the validity of that knowledge, but it's also about citing it and giving that sovereignty back to that community. So there's a lot of things embedded within that. And that is back to going back into working in good relationship with other people. If we're, if we're actually continuing, continuing that kind of um, violence and really abuse of Indigenous people and their knowledge, we are actually perpetuating that colonial system instead of disrupting it and creating things that are in alignment with whether it's the local context or uh, looking on the Global um, Indigenous Data Alliance and our uh, care and, and uh, fair principles. I think that there's a lot of things that people have done. I mean, I look at things like the Native American uh, protocols on uh, uh, related to that, it took over 10 years, I believe, I think it was 12 for the Society of American Archivists to adopt that. That is the work that people did off the side of their plate in addition to their jobs. And I look at that in Canada with a lot of similarities. We had some Canadians on there as well, too, or people that are from Indigenous communities now located in the country now known as Canadian. I don't want to call them Canadian because that would be, might be offensive, but I do think that uh, that is really important for us to uh, recognize that a lot of the burden of this has been done by Indigenous peoples and has been done for generations by Indigenous people. And if we're talking about reconciliation and working with Indigenous communities, the burden of reconciliation isn't on Indigenous people. It's on non-Indigenous people to work in a good way with Indigenous people and to do that labor. Yes, it's work. It's a lot of work. I'm not going to say it's not. It's a long process, as Jane mentioned, but it's a really rewarding and worthwhile process because uh, reactivating and those knowledges uh, coming alive and that language becoming more vibrant, vibrant is such a beautiful 
experience working with the community. And I would say it's probably one of the most rewarding things that you can do um, as an ally in this field or a co-conspirator or whatever terminology you would like to use. But um, we value those people and we value uh, people like Jane who's come along and spent her career working with our communities to be able to make these things happen alongside of us. And I think that that's really important to work in a respectful way. So I'll just leave it at that. Any other thoughts on um, rematriation and digital collections before we move on to the audience questions? Okay, so one audience member was asking, are you aware if there's a Creative Commons license specific to IK um, where it mentions the relationships of context and proper use? So Creative Commons does not have a license like this. However, um, local contexts who can speak more um, expertly about this has TK labels. So I'd love to pass it to you both to speak a little bit about how those work and what those are. Stephanie, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Um, so we have labels and we have notices. And I think it's really important to think about um, the difference between those two, what the distinction between those two. And this is, Jane, you can probably talk more, more to this in a moment, but um, these are an extra legal um, item, right? We, we are not working within a legal framework with these, um, partly because it would just take forever to try to change things that have been imp implemented by the settler colonial societies, um, and partly because we, we want to do this now. We need, to, we need to do this now. How can we do this now? And so we have we have um, labels that our communities are able to apply to their their data and their items, um, and we have some really fun examples that uh, of how our, our communities can apply these labels that say, um, you know, we have some that you, wh what is the provenance of this information? Who who owns it? Where where is it coming from? Um, communities can you know put a label that they're open to collaborate with with institutions with other folks um or that they're not that this information is something that they they want to hold close to to, to their community um the the notices are really for our institutions and and um as um as somebody who worked for an institution for a really long time, I love these notices because we can put the notice on a piece of information, on an item in a collection, um, and it really says that the institution is willing to work with indigenous communities. Like, like Camille was just talking about, there's a lot of work there that needs to be done. There's a lot of labor that needs to be put in. And these notices are a way for institutions to start doing that work, to show that they are willing to do some of that work and to make some of those connections. Um, you know, I think I think that that as we use notices, our institutions really also have a responsibility to do more than just put a notice on there. Um, it means that they have an obligation to work with the communities that they hold collections from for um, so, th so I think that this, this is a way, this is one way that it's not um, the only answer, but but having these notices and these labels that we can put on information, especially digital information that can be out there, um, is, is a way to, to connect that item back to its Indigenous community, which is a really important piece. Um, Jane, what am I, what am I missing in that, in that question, or that answer? No, no, I think that's great. I think the the thing that we would add and why there isn't a license and where we, we didn't begin with um, licenses is because uh, for nearly 95% of uh, Indigenous collections that are held in cultural institutions, Indigenous communities are not the legal rights holders, therefore they cannot have a license. Um, so we began thinking about what do we do for the for the majority of material? How do we mark that material differently? How do we bring Indigenous interests and authority back into different spaces? It doesn't mean that there won't be a license down the track and certainly um, for communities that hold copyright in the kinds of material that they're producing today and into the future and certainly changing those uh, imbalances as you know, copyright is a tool that can be utilized, but it has real limits. 
for uh, Indigenous interests as well. And so communities being really aware of what the limits are. Um, we kind of might see a different kind of license um, that gets developed. I think what's exciting coming up in the next little while in general, and I'm just going to put the put the plug out there, is that um, Creative Commons and Local Context will be running a, um, a training together to look at how certain kinds of uh, applying Creative Commons license and then applying uh, uh, local context notices or labels um, within institutional frameworks um, can happen. We develop local context to be complementary to any other existing licensing system, not in competition, uh, so that this becomes something that communities are able to uh, add in addition to or providing actually just providing more information about who rights holders are, what the challenges of those rights holders are, um, what kinds of protocols need to sit with different kinds of material. I think, you know, we often see that the, the limits in the law are that it doesn't necessarily recognise Indigenous worldviews and wasn't created to incorporate those. And so we actually had to develop something that was outside the existing legal system, which is why we call them extra legal, an extra legal initiative that can actually deal with the complexity of Indigenous knowledge systems themselves um, and actually recognise that too. So that's kind of why there isn't a licence. Um, it's a kind of a long winded answer, but have, please get in contact with us or, or kind of attend the training that we're going to run together um, to kind of find out more about the kind of complementarity that we've developed between CC and local contexts. Wonderful, thanks so much. Uh, so another audience question is a recent at a recent wiki conference in Berlin um, on Providence re provenance research in the con con context of restitution discussed whether it's best to slowly digitize with proper care, um, but many argued it's better to put the records out there ASAP, even if using racist or incorrect language. So is there a quicker so that there is a quicker possibility of identification and return? I wonder what the panel thinks. I was just wondering if I could address that. I think I talked about that earlier about preservation. So preservation is first, and that's paramount. And that's the first thing that you do with any collection is see what is at risk or what's fragile and what you need to preserve either by digitization or other methods. Um, Putting something out there uh, with the racist terminology is, is showing that historical record, but only if you put it out there with respectful terminology actually being the primary way, but we're not going to, uh, we don't want to erase the historical record. I mean, these things happened, it's colonial, um, it's a legacy of colonization. And so uh, we don't want to erase history, we want to know what history is so we learn from it and don't repeat that in the future, right? So I think that this is really critical. This is what's been done in many uh, instances and uh, we can think of the um, Holocaust Museum for an example to be able to do that so that that doesn't repeat itself. The, yes, there is racist terminology that's there, but we need to still retain that because it is a record of, um, of humankind, of our civilization and how we're changing. And so I think that that is important to actually have that. And some people still sadly search by that terminology. Uh, that's racist and stereotypical and antiquated and often racial slurs. They will go and look through that, uh, which is a little bit sad, but that is about changing the way that we have that imprint of reference for each other and creating that within our um, subject headings or access points. I will say that sharing before you've actually worked on that is probably pretty problematic because then you're perpetuating that racist and stereotypical. So you can preserve without and digitize without sharing and i think that that is the um probably more respectful and um uh you know contemporarily uh, uh um uh, as a professional the way that we would probably approach that um uh, uh preservation so i think that that's where i would come from personally i think there's institutions that do both um there's institutions that um do warnings make clear that there are um, uh, racist and uh, derogatory uh, language that's going that's being used, um, and that you know people need so making the public informed about that in the existence of those records um, is one 
one strategy rather than just perpetuating and creating further cultural harm, which is kind of what Camille is talking about in the further circulation of that racist and derogatory, uh, not only language, but mindset and way in which people are being constructed and portrayed. But I think that there is really um, a deliberateness that probably needs to happen with the circulation of that those kinds of materials that takes account of the cultural harm that happens in the perpetual circulation of those stereotypical uh, constructions of people, that they have continued daily harm. I mean, I think Camille began talking about murdered and missing Indigenous women uh, in what's currently known in Canada and also what's currently known in the United States. And that is part of the circulation of these terms. Uh, so kind of connecting particular kinds of uh, violence, whether it's language and, you know, what that carries forward is must be part of the responsibility of an institution. It's not just um, circulation for circulation's sake. It is actually creating a strategy, being deliberate, making a policy around that, um, and, and working through the complications that that produces. Like I said before, like, there is a tension in the fast approach and who that hurts. And in a slower approach that is actually working with communities. Um, you can digitize and make that available internally and then make the, the, the deliberate approach to communities to make an assessment around that material rather than just all lobbing it online. Uh, so it continues to kind of do very particular harm. So I don't know, thinking through those kinds of questions I think is really important. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm just kind of checking the time and noticing that folks may um, be starting to trickle out. Um, any final words on this question or anything else before I um, pass it to Bridget for a um, for a fin some final words? Well, I would really like to say, uh, Madhu, thank you and raise my hands to Creative Commons for providing a platform and a forum for this discussion. I believe that this is a critical and timely um, discussion that we need to continue and I would love to see uh, more collaboration because we obviously see that there's a huge need for this, um, not only in um, uh, in uh, in uh, the um, some of the areas that we've talked about and some of the countries that we've talked about, but really globally. And I think that that is where we can move forward and leave that for future generations that we've tried to do things in a respectful way and that we're trying to move forward in a good way and to be able to address some of that colonial legacy that we still see in um, many institutions. So I wanna say thank you and really appreciate the chat and, and just wanna hold up my hands again to my fellow um, panelists as well too for their incredible wisdom and insight, my dear. I just want to say thank you as well. And um, it's a privilege to be part of this panel with Erna and Stephanie and Camille. So thank you for putting it together. Um, I really appreciate it. And I think these are these are some of the most prescient uh, questions of our time in relationship to how do we respectfully, thoughtfully, carefully uh, deal with colonial legacies, but also create different kinds of futures that mean that Indigenous people are deciding those futures as well. Uh, so thank you for the time and for everybody joining us. Uh, we'll be the Tonka. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. I feel like I um, have learned a lot, a lot, a lot from, from my fellow panelists today. So thank you so much for having this conversation and letting me be part of it. Indeed, thank you. I've learned so much in this very short amount of time. Um, yeah, much appreciated. And thank you for the invitation as well. Thank you so much for the privilege of letting me kind of uh, dive into this conversation and poke around and um, ask some tough questions. It's been really a wonderful learning experience for me as well. And um, that I'll pass it to Bridget. Thank you. Thank you all. Um... I really want to thank our, our panelists. So once again, thank you so much to Stephanie, to Erna, to Camille, and to Jane. Um, you really generously shared your knowledge with us um, and you really helped shed light on these really fundamental issues that are at the heart of what we strive to do at Creative Commons, which is 
better sharing. It's really part of how we want to organize ourselves in order to promote this better form of sharing. And this is really a crucial part of that. Uh, I also want to thank the participants for your attention and all the many questions that you posed uh, in the chat. Uh, you kept it really lively throughout the whole webinar. Um, I also noticed that a lot of relationships have formed over the course of this webinar uh, on the sidelines. Um, and these are really so precious and they're really part of why we host these webinars and why we want to host a lot more in the future. Um, I also think that there's many concrete opportunities for collaboration. So I personally look forward to continuing this conversation and applying it in, in very concrete um, projects and activities. Um, thank you, Jocelyn, for your expert moderation. Uh, thanks in advance to Connor, uh, who's been in the chat and um, in the background. Um, you know, he will be editing this recording and making it available for those of you who are watching us in the future. So thank you very much for doing this. Um, like I said, we'll have more webinars happening throughout the year. So keep an eye out for upcoming announcement. Uh, but this is it for today. So thanks very much for watching. and. See you soon. Bye.